Hello, I'm Carl King. I'm your host for this latest episode of the Carl King Podcast. To support this show, head over to Patreon and pledge $5 a month. Every little bit helps me fund this podcast and my other creative projects. Episodical gratefulness, as always, to my endorsement logos, Toontrack, Ernie Ball, and Fractal Audio. Sorry I've been away for a while releasing some of my original music, but I have a big pile of new podcast episodes already recorded and coming your way, and this is the first of them. Today, it's an interview with Mike Keneally, best known for playing in Frank Zappa's band, Steve Vai's band, and Joe Satriani's band. He's created one of my favorite records of all time. Look this up, everyone. The Vi Piano Reductions, in which he plays a selection of Steve Vai's guitar music on solo piano. Truly enchanting and scary. He also happened to play 70s classic rock guitar and do many character voices for my album Grand Architects of the Universe. You can find that on Apple Computers iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Bandcamp, and my own shop. I will personally put it in a white padded envelope and ship it to you. I have to say this is the most uncomfortable interview I've done in years. And I didn't realize it, but all of my questions were about negative topics. I happened to be in the middle of a bad depression at the time. And that may also explain why it's been so many months, I think, since I've released a podcast episode. Uh, Decrease in energy, motivation, productivity. It happens. At one point, Keneally just stopped talking mid-sentence and looked out the window. Just then, his mic cable came unplugged as the subject became too dark. I edited that moment out because there was just a bunch of fumbling around and confusion and testing the mics. Uh, And I felt terrible because he clearly didn't want to talk about negative stuff anymore. I apologized, and as I glanced at my list, I realized all of the questions I prepared continued down my current path of darkness and cynicism. But I decided to push through it, and I think this was a much more candid and maybe three-dimensional interview because of it. And here we go. We're going now. Right now, it's a go. Mike Keneally. Okay, we only have 16 hours left on this, <laughs> on this recording. I am here with Mike Keneally in my vehicle. Welcome. A lovely vehicle it is. Thank you. This is the second interview I've done in a car. Uh, Travis you- Orban was a previous uh, victim who destroyed my last car, so I had to get another one. He actually was responsible for the demise of your car? Uh, he's a big guy. Very muscular. Uh, he heaved your car over <laughs> a lens crafter. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you some psychology type questions that's fantastic <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to make of that response but um, <laughs> uh, I'm very well, let's cu- examine it then. yeah so I'm very curious lately I'm, I'm less interested in asking the stock type of rock star questions you know about yeah I know that about uh, guitars and, and things like that what kind of pickups do you use bro I'm very curious about your sort of transformation because years ago I remember it might have been at some point when you were on tour with Beer for Dolphins and Vi or G3 something like that look that was they, those were actually real close to each other they were both in the like concentrated in the second half in 96 so that, yeah that era so like 96 I remember you putting some blogs up and I don't remember them really clearly and I still don't know if they might even be up still they somewhere. probably are uh, and they, I do remember they were very dark. You talked quite a bit about depression at the time. And I recall you being sort of an angry guy from what I picked up from it at that time. I don't think I can argue with any of that. Okay. <laughs> All right. I accept your thesis. <laughs> so I'm curious, how did, how did you transform from then to now? Because I saw your recent post about doing these baked potato shows, which is right up the street tonight, actually, and last night, you said we're going to be spreading the love. Oh, yeah. Which is probably not, maybe not something you would have said in 96 or so, or maybe you would have, I don't know. I might have said it with a a bit more ironic content than than I do now. And even 
as I say something like that in the present day with with complete sincerity, yeah, there's there's also just an undercurrent of ironic content to the idea of saying something like that. It, mm-hmm. it, it's it, it seems at the same time kind of a you know a, a parody of of you know, a Woodstock Nation type platitudes in a way, but I mean it 100 percent sincerely. You know, yeah, and I can tell that. I, I remember seeing you playing at. Great American Music Hall in San Francisco in 2002 or so. Okay, and yeah. And you were saying a lot of positive things, like sending positive vibes. I think maybe someone you knew was ill at the time, and you were asking people to send positive vibes or something um, like that. Well, let's look at the era in both cases. That's 2002. Yeah. So that's you know that's that's after that's after 9/11. That's that's after hmm. uh, it's after Bush. Um, after Bush. Okay. And and the the. The be- the beginning of the two thousands were uh, a dark time for me, especially around the time of the second Bush uh, election, but also around the time of the Baghdad invasion, both the and the sort of the lead up to that. Yes. Um. So that that kept me soul sick for the the first half of the two thousands. Wow. That, not that it was about me, you know. It's just like that was just my personal reaction to it. Was just yeah. to get really really down and really really dark. Okay. Um. And in those instances. There are times where you have to forcefully proclaim, yes, that I'm I'm attempting to radiate love. Yes, I'm a, I'm attempting to generate positivity, mm-hmm. as much to convince yourself to stay afloat, yeah, as it is to to share that sentiment. So, uh, for me, this week to put out stuff about radiating love is mm-hmm. is you know very much a reaction to everything that's happening in the in the country and in the world at the moment. Yes, uh, but. This time around, maybe I'm a little older, or maybe I just I'm choosing not to be as wounded as I was in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. But even though what's happening right now is insane mm-hmm. and horrifying on various levels, um, I I don't see myself being a, a positive contribution to the situation if I'm wallowing in sadness and negativity. And I also think that. There are some people who are in a position to get up on a stage and generate something, and I'm fortunate to have that opportunity. And I think you have to state your intent to yourself. What am I trying to do with these performances? Yeah. And I, there are times in my life where I would have wallowed in darkness, and that would inform the performances. Now I don't see any, you know, value in that hmm. from, from any angle. Well. For me, you yeah, know, that you know, other performers do their strongest stuff when they're wallowing in darkness, and and when I was younger, I did you know generate some strong stuff there, but I don't think it's worth the the bargain, and uh, and I don't think it's the best use of whatever energy I have to offer right now. I can identify with that. What I'm trying to understand because I'm a person who experiences a lot of depression through the years and on and off. And lately I've been very depressed and I, you know, I don't, I'm trying to get out of it, trying to fight my way out of it, Mm -hmm. lifting weights, going for walks, doing this podcast gives me a reason to get out and interact with people because otherwise it'd be like, I just never see anybody. So trying to understand how you went from being that, trying to kind of, uh, compare our paths. Well, I Uh, also, were you you that angry young thing? Yeah, I, I. I, well, even before I was a young man, when I was a very young child, I was I was I was defined by anger. Really? Yeah, that's where I started, and I think that over the the course of life, I've been attempting to siphon most of that out. Wow. Um, and I think twenty years ago was you know I'm still part of that arc, the process of trying to be done with it because when I was very young, when I was a child, I was you know I I processed everything as an injustice. And as a oh. as a personal injury, that, really? that was wrong with the world. You know, I I just felt how old though? I mean, uh, like you know, four to six, especially probably. I think maybe a little older. Wow, there were still like there were flashes of it. There were you know ex- explosive uh, you know fracking instances of it uh, for years afterward. But I would say when I was really young, there was a a period there where I was just I had like a hair trigger wow. type situation where I I would instantly become loudly upset and you know make life miserable for everybody in the vicinity so yeah that was you know my 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 standard mo for a a while there that's how i started Mm -hmm. and then i think 
over the course of years since then i've been i've been trying to to chill out <laughs> to back away from that so i think i'm 20 years further along now than i was in the 90s when i was writing that stuff and i also think that at the beginning of the internet you know because i was blogging in 1994 yeah that um there was less of a feeling that everyone was watching uh, and and I felt more when I was posting that stuff that it was more like a very private correspondence between me and a few people and I didn't really have a, a picture of how these things live on forever. Mm -hmm. um, so I was much more likely to reveal things about myself at the time. Yeah. And it would be, you know, inaccurate for me to suggest that I, I no longer experience feelings of depression because obviously it, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm way better at managing it and for me one of the uh one of the sort of crucial aspects of that is not to deny it exists but but to limit the amount of time that i spend looking at it and talking about it and writing about it that's the and that's hmm. that has dissuaded me from doing as much sharing about it because the, the moment that i would sit down to start writing about it, it i would feel like it was counterproductive to my my health and my growth that the better thing for me to do was to acknowledge the fact that it existed and, and then to immediately begin seeking ways to counteract it whether that be meditation or getting out of the house or yeah. going to the piano or, or that makes wh sense. whatever it might be the time spent even if it's eloquently expressing <laughs> the way you're feeling yeah. and sharing it with the world and also I say this completely non-judgmentally for anybody who f finds it an important therapeutic part of their thing to share this stuff online for me personally i my inclination is not to share that stuff online so it feels disingenuous in a way for me to put that stuff up there because that's when i start to think am i doing this to gain attention mm -hmm. you know am i what do i have some other promotional angle for wanting to put yeah. this online and uh, if you want to hear more of my depressed thoughts <laughs> check out my new album well, that's the thing. Tying it into that's the new album is the crucial thing. I I have the 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 luxury of being able to channel all that stuff into into the stuff that I do. Yeah. Whether it be an album or a performance. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm focused on performances rather than albums. I'm very excited about playing live. Yeah. Um, but last night I went up there and there's you know there's a lot of angst in the air right now, but I couldn't feel it in the room. You know, the room felt very peaceful and and receptive and together. So it was just a, a happy performance relaxed and and all sorts of crazy shit happened see another another yardstick that i use is w when i happen to see performances of myself on video from like the late 90s early 2000s when yeah. when i was going through any number of you know, vast psychological emotional uh shifts um a lot of that stuff is hard for me to watch because i let various energies overtake my better instincts as a musician i think mm. i would i would i would lose sight at times of how is what i'm doing really blending in with the sound of the music on the stage and in the room and 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 ideally when when you're really you know snapping live you're you're in a combination of performer head and producer head you know it's like from from where you're standing i, I or from where i'm standing i try to listen to everything that's on the stage and do whatever i can to guide it into something that sounds like a really satisfying finished product if somebody was sitting there listening to it on a record mm -hmm. so that's that's in my consciousness at the same time that i'm just trying to stay attuned with whatever spiritual slash uh professional performance practices you do in order to execute stuff correctly i had a thought while you were talking about that i i it, it's strange to me that think that to think that you were friends with frank zappa and that occasionally it's kind of a mind fuck to think like wait a minute we're actually not far from where frank lived and how do you think Frank dealt with that anger? It seemed like he channeled it 24 hours a day into what he was doing. Or uh, w what was your observation of that? Well, I just I never saw him like driven by anger to the point that it overtook his his uh, his good sense or his his behavior. He always you know processed that stuff, hmm. and he usually processed it in a very you know he was proudly cynical. But I don't think he was embittered and uh, and rendered inoperative by yeah. cynicism or anger you know and that's because he maintained simultaneously a very cosmic view of things you know his own personal cosmology and, and view of the universe and uh his willingness to 
uh, accept the the possibility of inexplicable greater energies you know like he he obviously sneered at you know most aspects of modern religion but he would you know often unironically refer to the pro- to the entity of something called god hmm. and never denied that such a, an energy likely existed in some form you know i i do think that that frank felt that there was you know an energy driving things beyond what humans could comprehend wow uh and then that that energy most people call it god <laughs> um, did, did he use the word god or you well yeah if you look in, in various essays and liner notes and and uh when he was talking about the big note and and he refers to god and then in parentheses says as energy which hmm. to me indicates you know w- at least a willingness to accept the fact that there is an, an energy driving things when he says you know another phrase that he used was the universe works whether we understand it or not you know it's and i don't think he thought that that was by accident not that i that he thought it was by divine design but Mm -hmm. i think that he his view of the universe was broad enough to accept the the likelihood uh that there is stuff going on that we don't understand and couldn't possibly explain it it's probably a force and intelligence you know however you choose to define intelligence greater than ours going back so to, and, and, okay. and, and going back to uh how you know frank was able to uh, to deal with that I, I think he was smart enough to realize that it didn't do him any favors uh to be uh crippled by it in any way he had you know he took a real dim view of victimhood which is obvious from songs like suicide chump and yeah. stuff he wasn't like he <laughs> he really thought people should figure out a way to get their shit together and yeah. you know and and he spent you know every day doing his version of keeping his shit together i just never saw him uh, you know laid low or, or victimized by anything yeah it seemed even towards the end in some of the final interviews he was still hanging in there yeah like, i think he at, at that point you know he just had a real clear-eyed understanding that sometimes really shitty things happen to people mm-hmm. uh because they do and you know he, you know, he didn't never once said why me. Uh, as as far as I know, I'm sure there were times where he goes, "This is fucked up. I wish this wasn't happening to me." Yeah. Did you want to continue on that, or was that? Uh, no, I did. As, as soon as I started thinking about Frank being ill, I instantly wanted to stop talking about it. Yeah. Okay. No problem. There was something I think in your blogs that I read back then. It was, and I wish I could remember this specifically, but it was something related to. Frank and his Grammy and you kicking a window. Oh, that was for the Zappa's universe. Yeah. Could you could you try to explain to me what that situation was and what what that was like for you? I I guess I mean it's that's that's I I feel like I put it out there pretty pretty clearly. But, yeah. Um, you know it was it was just um. I was angered by the Zappa's universe project because in the in the wake of it. It was done as it was put together as a tribute to Frank, you know, mm-hmm. a very genuine uh, tribute to Frank. And I was a part of it, and we all, we worked as hard as we could. There wasn't enough rehearsal period. It was really chaotic, and it was a miracle that the first uh, performance, which was the one that was recorded <laughs> out of four nights, they they recorded the first night because that was the night that Steve was able to be there. Oh. Um, so I understood that, but I also realized, my gosh, this is such a complex thing, and. I, it ended up falling to me to do like three times as many vocals for that show as I was supposed to do because we were running songs during the day and the people who had been assigned songs uh, hadn't learned them yet. And so, you know, they kept handing those things to me to sing instead. Hmm. Uh, so I ended up assuming more of a role than than I had expected to. And so that left me feeling kind of vulnerable because I was sort of out there as, as the guy. Um, and then because frank was too ill to attend um they he wasn't able to you know he he couldn't he was supposed to take part in the shows he was going to be do a guest performance and you know be there and receive the tribute receive the honors you know Mm -hmm. but he wasn't feeling well enough to get on the plane and and uh he wanted to smoke on the plane and they and you're not allowed to smoke on airplanes and he's just like you know what fuck this He, he went back to the house uh so we went ahead and did the shows tribute to frank and it got really, really good. There's some of the stuff in those shows was fantastic. I had a great time doing it. I loved it. And then afterward, uh, Polygram, who put out Zappa's Universe, sued Frank for 
not not being at the show and and i thought i could see where they might you know justifiably be miffed that he didn't show up because he because he couldn't smoke on the plane but there's but he was also really ill yeah and it's understandable for a guy in that in that condition to just go you know what i'm i'm not feeling well i don't want to travel and i i understand these people are paying tribute to me but it is wasn't really in frank's psychological makeup to want to sit there for two hours and, and yeah. be honored and you know i think that kind of make him uncomfortable but they sued him and and so at that point i was i was upset because i was a part of a project that was meant to pay tribute and it ended up you know turning into just this this unnecessary legal thorn in oh, his man. side when he, he should have been you know primarily focusing on his health and survival yeah. so i was upset about being a part of of a project that turned into a negative for Frank rather than a positive. Yeah. And then uh there are other aspects to the recording and stuff. It was just it, some other things that don't that don't bear mentioning and I was standing in a Tower Records with Joe Travers when it won a Grammy and I became upset and uh ended up kicking a window. Well, I don't I don't I mean it seems like maybe you feel embarrassed looking back at this point about that but to me that doesn't seem i don't feel (laughs) embarrassed for you for doing something like that because you were younger you were i'm not that i'm not terribly embarrassed by the kicking of the window it's 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 more the the whole episode and the the way it affected me psychologically yeah um that i you know i just wish that i'd been able to process it better Mm. um not strictly the moment of window kicking although that was a (laughs) stupid thing to do but just uh, the the way the whole thing affected me I feel like I'm. I'm just. I don't want you to feel like I'm having you here to depress you or something. I mean, it's, no, man. It's, fuck. It's, you know, I'll, I'll get the opportunity to, to play it all out of my system later. <laughs> Are you coming to the gig tonight? Yes. Right on. You talked about having a messiah complex. Oh, I remember that. Okay. And I immediately was like, "Talk about that," <laughs> you know, like that, because uh-huh. that that immediately struck me as uh, I've always felt very much an outsider and and a social outcast and all of these things and i've had a lot of strange mystical experiences growing up which may or not have been real uh been a very depressed person a very anxious person had a lot of panic attacks blah 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 been you know up and down through all this bullshit and when i hear you say that you had a messiah complex i'm immediately like i want to hear about that (laughs) you you know Uh, okay so can you tell me a little bit about that i don't know if you've talked about that elsewhere I don't in, know, in and, much I, and, depth. I, and and not and you know, I'll explicate on that a topic, you know, yeah. to the degree that I feel able to express myself. But I think that I don't know if I'm using that terminology properly because I haven't analyzed, I haven't you know studied it, researched it. Um, what I think I mean when I indicate that was is there was a time where I thought. that I was, you know, just like humming along effectively enough with the, with the work that I was doing that I had somehow resonated, you know, strongly with the the core of whatever makes everything tick. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I thought that I had something resembling a direct line to that energy, I'm not sure if that is, if Messiah complex is the best way to describe that feeling. Okay. Cause I, I felt more like I was being fed, you know, that there, there was a channel that was a, a yeah. direct line to that, mm-hmm. but I never necessarily felt suddenly that I am the Messiah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Consciously I get, I, to, gotcha. to my, to yeah, my totally. knowledge. But I think that, that, that can manifest in various degrees of, of hubris and entitlement uh, to the point where maybe you're you're not allowing yourself to believe I am the Messiah, you know, aka I am hot shit because I'm in touch with this divine strain of inspiration, mm-hmm. and I'm receiving messages from a greater energy, and they're telling me what to do, and whatever else I need to do in order to serve that message is is okay because it's all you know it's all part of the moment or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, I no longer, you know, like the idea that that an artist who might be doing a good job at their art deserves any kind of of a of a break on you know decent human behavior and the way they treat the people in their life right or, or and in addition and also the way they treat themselves 
you know, I don't buy that any longer. And at the time right. when, when I was younger, I, I was, it was convenient and comfortable for me to, to fall in, into that delusion. Was that, is that related to growing up and getting these seemingly great jobs in the music industry and having a name and, and, you know, traveling around the world playing on stage with Steve Vai and Frank Zappa and all these things, does that create sort of a weird bubble for the ego in a way? Well, it, 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 it creates varying degrees of delusion. I think that that takes some time to grow out of because, uh, I think when you're younger and especially when it, in my case, where I was jettisoned from complete amateur status to suddenly being Frank Zappa's band, <laughs> which because that was my my uh, my dream, mm -hmm. and my my uh, everything that I wanted in life when I was growing up, and that was where I started my professional career, mm -hmm. which l left me disoriented. You know, when it was suddenly done, and that band ended, you know, sooner than I I was expecting, and. Uh, and the way it ended was was so cataclysmically uh, disappointing and unsatisfying that that uh, I was left reeling by the experience. Was that a period of what four years or something that that you were doing that? What with Frank? Yeah. Uh, no, much shorter. I I joined in uh, October 1987. Uh, <laughs> in a couple of months, it'll be the the 30th anniversary, um, and then we rehearsed for four months, and then we toured for four months. And that was the the end. It was oh, it was man. really an eight month experience, all in all. I stayed involved with the Zappas, yeah, you know, for eight more years until I left Dweezil's band in ninety six. But that was the you know only time I was directly under Frank's employ as a as a member of his oh, band. Oh wow! And uh, you know, I, I, I hung out. I, I still wanted to be near that energy, so I like I hung out near Frank as much as I could after that. But and then you know starting in late 1990 started you know playing with with Dweezil and that went on for six years. Hmm. Um, but to, Did, to back up to to your yeah, question yeah, yeah, no, about, about the uh, the ego bubble, um, when I was younger there was a part of me that thought that you know I guess that there was a certain amount of reflected glory from from having played with guys like Frank and, and Steve mm -hmm. that inevitably was going to result in positive things for for my own work. And that was that's a naive belief, you know. There's 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 still a lot more work that you have to do on your actual work. You, you can't just uh, assume that association with these people are are going to be the be all end all. And uh, you know that was just a sort of a childish, naive belief that I had right at the very beginning that that these associations were going to have more impact than they actually do. And I think I may have taken the my eye off the ball in terms of getting my own performing act together i th you know the, the stuff that i do is really peculiar I, th I, th I think that when i was younger i thought that as long as i stayed what i thought was inspired and creative that that were people were going to respond to it but mm -hmm. you know i i didn't know enough to take a look at just you know it's not just quality it's the it is it's the it's the quality of it in the sense of the, the sound of it, the, the image of it, the uh, impact of it. It's, it's, not a, it's not a standard conventional or it doesn't you know, align with any of the, 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 the sort of accepted <laughs> successful things. And, 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 and I don't say that as a value judgment because many of those accepted successful things are fantastic. Uh, I've been uh, obsessed with Earth, Wind, and Fire lately. I listen to their records and they're incredibly, uh, you know, they're incredibly polished, you know, very accessible, very, you know, just like buffed to a high sheen. And, but the stuff is absolutely fantastic. It's just incredible, incredible music. Um, so there are ways to give your music a structure and a texture that that are really appealing and i just never did that i never even looked at it so in some ways i was like just wasn't equipped to know what <laughs> what it takes to reach a bunch of people and it took me by surprise when i didn't um so i think i was in a bit of an ego bubble to de to describe your you know, to use your phrase hmm. i'm curious about your thoughts on I, and I wish I could put this together more articulately, but <laughs> it's as if the music industry has ended in a, in a lot of ways. It's such a... It, it, the more I'm around musicians over the years and around the music industry, etc., 
the more I, I am continually disillusioned more and more to levels of, you know, I heard recently that there was a famous guitarist that had to sleep on the floor of the venue because he couldn't afford a motel room and he just slept on some mats that they had in the corner or something. And I'm just like, what is going on? Like how, how? Charlie Parker slept on mats too. You know, it's it's like, I don't, I don't, everything just goes cycles around. I'm not saying that the music business isn't in a really scary situation right now, but but we've seen that coming for years and years and years now, it's, and it's all it's all you know keyed on the fact that people aren't paying for records. You know, it's if if a record sells thirteen thousand copies in a week, that goes to the number one in Billboard. You know, that's that's uh, that's astonishing. You mm-hmm. know, it didn't used to be that way when you go back to the seventies, where you know an underperforming record might have been a million and a half copies from a band that sold three million copies the year before. So it's clear that that's been on the way out, that that's totally changing. So at that point, you just have to, you just got to adjust. But I think that these sort of paradigm shifts happen in so many aspects of life all the time. And it's just part of survival to keep your eye on them and, and uh, shift as needed. It seems to me the people that are able to hang in there and keep being creative in the midst of this it requires a sort of endless energy and you might end up being paid 10% of, of what you really are putting out there in the world or 1%. You know, I look at Frank Zappa was working 24 hours a day or whatever. Dweezil, I hang around him. He works insane all the time mm-hmm. if he's not with his kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's his only other thing that he like shuts off everything and focuses on the kids. Thomas Lang total ass kicker works every day all day just as far as i can tell these types of people are just going to keep going they don't seem to be their standard living does not match their output of work okay um does that make sense Uh, yeah yeah but i don't i just honestly don't think nothing's guaranteed and rules change so if if and I also think that they are naturally energetic people, so yes. it 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 fits in with with what their natural mode of behavior is going to be anyway. Mm-hmm. And if you know, and yeah, the the net result of that isn't as much uh, financial reward as as they would have gotten for the same commensurate amount of work ten years ago. Mm-hmm. But that's a fact of life for everybody, or at least you know everybody underneath a certain uh, you know, tax bracket. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I want to ask on this same topic of financial reward and everything and, and uh, surviving as a uh, as a professional I mean what <laughs> and this is almost like a stock question but what can you what is the core thing that you need to remember when you're doing this other than like oh you just gotta love the music man you know it's almost like do you think that maybe that endless energy is what's required and it just is a type of temperament of a person that well, will just it, do it anyway that, that, that depends on how you define endless energy uh in well in my case or in anyone's case it it's it just you just have to have you know clear eyes about what's required to keep your your life moving forward and uh and in my case it's i, I have to be careful to keep a certain balance between you know, totally personal projects that that i want to do and projects that that actually you know, pay for my survival mm-hmm. that I still want to do because they're fun. And, you know, in, in recent years, that's been Satriani. Satri- the, the Satriani touring mm-hmm. is, is the thing that allows my life to continue at the same time that I really enjoy doing it and that it actually, you know, provides a professional benefit because it, it puts, it exposes me to people who wouldn't see me otherwise. So that's, that's a win-win, you know, but, there have been times where I didn't, uh, for whatever reason, I didn't have a, a touring gig like that, and I didn't make the time or or generate the energy to pursue them, <laughs> and that resulted in several years of struggle. You know, for for my comfortable continued existence, I need to divide my time between, you know, touring projects that pay yeah. and you know personal projects that barely pay. Um, and that's what works for me. You know, for for other people everything's gonna 
be you know the, the dynamics are different in every case with with Dweezil and Thomas they already have their machinery in place they have their reputations they have a, a they have a, a backlog of work um, they have a body of work and, and uh, but that's, they don't seem to be resting on it either they're like no you know maintaining exactly. it every day it's yeah, like get well, up do it yeah that's a, it's because that's what's required in order to keep a, a, a career viable you have to you know, demonstrate an ongoing, unless you have like Beyonce level mystique, you can't just like, <laughs> you know, have people waiting. What, what, what are they doing next? You know, yeah. you, you just have to keep being productive. Um, but in, to go back to this phrase, endless energy, you know, ener- energy in the sense of, uh, you know, you know, focused awareness and intention. Uh, if you are, you know, putting out all this, all this energy or, or what could be defined as energy, but which really is almost like a, an aggressive kind of work, 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 uh, achieve, <laughs> yeah. achieve, achieve, destroy, destroy, destroy. And, and, yeah. and somehow it's not paying off. Then the energy you need to, to, uh, to feel, uh, is the ability to look at your situation and recalibrate if required, you know, maybe your your skill set, your gifts, your purpose lies in some other complete direction that you may have just glanced off in your life, but not pursued. Uh, it, it, you have to, you have to consider the possibility that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and and, it, and take a look at that. Now, have you done that? I have. I have. Uh, there were, there I'm not were, saying that you know, what you're doing isn't no, working. No, 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 but uh, you're, I think you're asking, have there been times where I asked myself that question yeah. and felt that to be the case? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And, and in those instances, that, that's when you, you know, choose to change your, your uh, you know, employment situation or mm-hmm. you choose to go off in another direction for a while. And, and you, that's, you know, you find out whether or not it was the right choice, but it, it's, you know... I think in every case it's it's the right choice, but it's it's not always a, a painless process. You know, once you you decide to make that transition. One last thought. I want to throw this out there. I, w- I want to say first of all, <laughs> before I finish this up, I think this was a super cool interview. It was very uncomfortable for me. I feel very <laughs> awkward. It feels like a big mess. Like it just uh, you you seem uncertain about answering things. It's and it's just I'm asking awkward questions. But so I want to thank you for that. <laughs> but I'm curious, are you just going to, I mean, what the fuck do we do now with this Trump situation? <laughs> oh, my God. How do we, uh, oh can God. we finish this off with no, you, no, you no, maybe uh, saying, uh, what, uh, what no, do we do? No, I can't possibly. Come on. No, I, I can't possibly. <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the time remaining, which is two minutes ago, yeah. is when I should have left for the yeah, venue. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and that's too huge a topic. And there's a part of me that's just like. You don't need like, to get into the topic, but I mean, just. Uh, any any last words on that? Any final? Just throw anything. I don't out even want to invoke that motherfucker's name. Honestly, I don't. Okay. I, I, I I I really don't wish to think about him. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean. Okay, I'll I'll just say this. Um, this this idea of if you're if you're not a, not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. That to me is a limiting view because I think when people, a lot of people say that they're they're saying it in a way that if if you're not out in the street with a protest sign, then you're not helping. And I think mm-hmm. that there are many more subtle ways than people can be a part of the resistance. And 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 somebody doesn't necessarily have to feel guilt ridden, which I'm finding online is a, a lot of the you know the, the people who are you know resisting uh, the insanity you know resisting Trump and his administration and his regime uh, are are becoming very snipey at other people who feel the same way they do but have you know a d- different less overt ways of, of, of dealing with it I've done some of that and and I think everybody has to to work to their strengths mm-hmm. to, to be an effective part of this mission. And I think that people who are part of the resistance need to be as as generous and inclusive and as as you know freedom loving <laughs> in that process as they want the society to become you know if if, if you if if you want a, a <laughs> the society that for a, a brief moment some of us thought was on on its way when when Bernie seemed to be you know doing a good job you know mm-hmm. about a year and a half ago. Um, as as naive as that might have been, or whatever, and and believe me, I have a, a lot of bitterness about the fact that it's the DNC that in, ensured that uh, that Trump Trump got elected. Mm-hmm. But, 
but I won't go there. <laughs> um, I I think that you you ha- your approach to the resistance shouldn't be as as uh, as narrow minded and reactionary and violent and you know dunderheaded as 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 the enemy are. Okay. Uh, that sums it up. Okay. Well, thank you for this awkward shit. I'm sorry to put you through this. I hope you're satisfied with the situation. I'm fine. Okay, you're I cool got no with everything. Issues. All I, right. It's a, it, I, I, I don't want you to feel that I was like reluctant or 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 like you know bothered by any of the questions. It's 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 just about what's the best way to express myself. These are interesting concepts that you've introduced, and I want to be accurate. Basically, I want I want to know exactly how I feel before I say anything, and sometimes it takes me a second to process it. Yeah, yeah, understood. Well, bye.